Hi, I'm Bob Welds, and this is part three of the stress strain diagram. Now that we're a little more familiar with the stress strain diagram, let's look at some of the information it's going to tell us. We'll talk about some of the different ways to measure stiffness and strength. When we pulled on the steel sample, that is when we performed our tensile test, we noticed that there was a linear or straight line relationship between the stress and the strain. That is, for equal increments of stress, there were equal increments of strain. This is known as Hooke's Law, and you might have seen it in a physics class. Sparky will demonstrate the law here. We'll hang up a spring here, and we'll add these one-pound weights to the spring. We'll measure how much the spring elongates with each weight and graph the results. Now you can try this at home. Okay, when we add a one-pound weight, the spring stretches one quarter of an inch. We add another pound, and it stretches another quarter of an inch. Let's add another, and another, and another. When we graph this, it makes a straight line. We say that there's a linear relationship between the weight and the stretching. Now that's basically Hooke's law. Notice that if we had a stiffer spring, the line would be steeper and it would stretch less. When we ran our tensile test in the first video, the bar was acting like a very stiff spring. Inside our bar, the metal atoms were getting stretched farther and farther away from each other, but none of them was being moved out of position. We call this kind of stretching elastic deformation. When we stretch the bar this way, it remains unchanged. If we let go, it would go back to its original length. Now, let's look at the slope of that line again. The slope is the rise over the run. And in this case, the rise is the change in stress and the run is the change in strain. We can use the symbol delta again to talk about these changes. On a stress-strain diagram, the slope of this line has a special name. It's called the modulus of elasticity. You'll also hear it called Young's modulus. We use a capital letter E to represent the modulus of elasticity. In this diagram, it's being used to see how much this beam bends. It's on the bottom here because you see, if a material is stiffer, it bends less. Now if we stretch the bar too far, it won't go back to its original length when we let go. The point where that happens is called the elastic limit. What is happening at that point is that some of the atoms are getting moved out of their place, and they won't go back when the force is removed. When the atoms of the material start to slide past each other like that, we say the material is beginning to yield. The amount of stress at this level is called the yield strength. Some materials have this little squiggle here, and there's an upper yield and a lower yield point. In some materials, the yield point is less obvious. So something called the 0.2% offset yield is used. To find this yield point, you just draw a line parallel to the line formed during the elastic deformation. You start that line at the 0 0.002 mark, that is the 0.2 divided by 100, that is 0.2%. The place where this line intersects the stress strain curve is the 0.2% offset yield strength. Now this little flat area is where the material keeps stretching without raising the stress level. This is called yield point elongation. This is where the material starts deforming in a different way. You see, the deformation here is no longer elastic. We are permanently changing the shape of the steel. Kind of like pulling on modeling clay. The bar will be permanently longer from now on. We call this kind of shape changing plastic deformation. In plastic deformation, the atoms slip past each other and the bar is permanently deformed. Materials that can do this are called ductile materials. If the atoms tend to break apart instead of slipping, the material doesn't deform plastically, and we say that it's brittle. The stress-strain diagram for a brittle material would look like this. So our graph keeps increasing for a while, and as the atoms slip past each other, they tend to get in each other's way, and this makes it harder for them to slide. The name for this is work hardening or strain hardening, and this makes many materials stronger but it also makes them more brittle. Now, here at the top of the diagram, the stress has built up to its maximum value. This is called the ultimate strength. And since we're pulling on the bar, it's called the ultimate tensile strength, or UTS. Now, usually, if someone says a material has a tensile strength of some amount, they're talking about the UTS, or the ultimate tensile strength. But be careful, because sometimes they may be talking about the yield strength, and it's important to know the difference. Now, after this peak is where the material starts necking down. At this point, it gets easier and easier to stretch out until it finally breaks, here at the end. 
We call that fracture. You can tell a lot about a material by looking at it after it fractures. Brittle materials tend to break off flat like this without necking, and ductile materials tend to look like this. A lot of times they make this cup and cone fracture. You can also put the broken pieces back together and measure the percent elongation. That is, how much their length was able to be permanently increased. You just divide the increase in length by the original length. Here's a quick example. Okay, I think you know enough about the stress strain diagram to start using it. Let me know if you want to learn more. We'll keep using this diagram when we talk about engineering, machining, even welding. I'm Bob Welds, and these are Weld Notes. Mm -hmm.